Welcome to South Pod, the first and foremost podcast created to tell the true story of tech innovation in the American South. South Pod is hosted by John Yerian and Stanfield Gray and produced by Dig South Tech Media. Dig South Tech Media is the South's tech hub, the place where leading global brands connect with the most scalable startups. Visit us at digsouth.com and follow us on social media at Dig South. This episode of South Pod was recorded as a part of the Dig South 2020 Virtual Tech Summit. It features Rich Resgatis, the founder and CEO of Flowwater. Now let's dig into South Pod with Rich Resgatis. <music> Everyone, welcome uh, to this uh, session. Is me again with you, Joel Sadler. I am uh, very excited to introduce our speaker. Um, we've got uh, Rich of Flow Water. The um, basically forget everything you thought you knew about how good water can taste. Um, the, the, this is next level purification. So we're going to hear from, from Rich about Flow Water, but then also how to grow a company beyond your initial target market. And I'm super excited to be here with you all listening. And without further ado, Rich, why don't you uh, go ahead and get things started for us? Great, Joel. Thank you. It's great to be a part of the Dig South Virtual Summit. Hope everybody's having a great morning. Uh, as Joel mentioned, I am talking today about how to grow a company outside of your target market. And I'm going to give a little bit of a backgrounder to begin. Uh, this is my personal backgrounder. Uh, I've been running Flowwater for the last eight plus years, I'm co founder and CEO of Flowwater. And, you know, today I'm going to talk about the, the, the journey of kind of zero to one, so to speak. Um, but prior to that, I've uh, run several tech companies, uh, CPG companies and then a variety of other roles that kind of date back to uh, even early stage doing some Fortune 500 stuff and a couple sales marketing roles there. And best dad, uh, best job that I've had so far is being a dad. I've got two, uh, two teenage daughters in the late teen years. And so that's a little bit about me just jumping right into what we're gonna be covering today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the company background and then really start in the beginning. So we were incorporated in 2013. Uh, incubated the company largely out of Silicon Valley, uh, kind of a typical kind of garage to coffee shop to funding to growth story uh, in the Valley, as well as, you know, not just in the Valley anymore, everywhere across the United States, this, this has been and is happening. Uh, and then I'll talk about really the beginnings of commercialization in 2014, how we started scaling in phases, uh, sharing a few best practices along the way, and then I'll end with a QA and a session. So, uh, just to frame this and provide a little bit of context around some of the learnings and the experiences that I'll share along the way, because I'm sure many of the people in the audience are running SaaS companies or digital companies or e-com or even CPG. Uh, I don't know how many hardware companies that are out there, but there might be, you know, I'm sure there are some hardware companies that are out there. I, I don't know how many hardware B2B companies are out there that kind of has its own unique twist to it. I think a lot of the same fundamentals apply. Uh, however, in hardware, things move a bit more slowly and linearly, uh, certainly compared to the companies that are run in the digital space and uh, even CPG for that matter. So we've tried to kind of break the conventional hardware linearity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but in order to make sure that that stuff makes sense, I gotta kind of explain a little bit about the company the vision of our company, Flow Water, and you can check check us out, drinkflowwater.com, uh, at drinkflowwater uh, on social. The vision of the company is to inspire the world with water. The mission of our business is provide the world's best tasting water to anywhere consumers work, rest, and play. And in the process of doing that, put an end to single-use plastic water bottles. Uh, and then the brand promise is that we basically, uh, it's very simple, transform any tap water into clean, great trace, uh, tasting plastic-free water. Uh, the way that we do that, you, uh, you will start to see here, is through a 
device that is a hardware, a piece of hardware. It's a, a piece of flow water hardware that connects into any potable water line, ultimately anywhere in the world. So you hook a flow water refill station and ultimately what we're building is an entire platform of products. And so I didn't put a slide in here, just kind of out of the interest of brevity, but what we are building and are going to end the year with is a whole product platform of flow water devices, kind of a good, better, best for businesses and also for consumers that you hook up to your faucet or you plug into your kitchen countertop and start like making, brewing, creating great water straight from your tap using a flow water device. Uh, primarily what we spent the last uh, seven years in commercialization on, and we're on the fifth generation right now, is a flow water refill station. And so the idea behind a flow water refill station is that we get flow water everywhere to people, wherever they work, rest and play, uh, making people, people healthier, happier, and more hydrated. So let me kind of dig into this and start with our initial commercialization strategy. And this is not just our initial, but I mean, this has been what we have been executing on consistently over the last seven plus years of having product out in the market and we'll continue to focus on years to come. So how we go about uh, doing this changes year to year. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and what we learned, what we messed up on, what we pivoted from tactically to you know where we saw hot spots and just started putting resources on it. Uh, but the way that we grow our business and most of our customers up to this point have been hotels, schools, corporations, uh, gyms, retailers, essential businesses, uh, now more in kind of a COVID world where we've made some acceleration, some shift, and then a lot of events. So up to this point over the last, uh, up until really the last six months, we've been largely a B2B play. That, I've, I've run this from the get-go and really built this from the get-go though, in mind of a consumer brand. So one thing that we're trying to do is take kind of a consumer livelihood and a consumer essence to a B2B world and then use that as a springboard to unlock uh, what is a pretty extensive opportunity and also a massive need in consumer households. So the three prongs of that uh, right now are direct and indirect sales. And direct sales are, we got our own sales reps, we got a couple techs, we got a couple trucks, we've got a distribution center in San Francisco and they're calling on lots of local businesses in the city of SF and LA and San Diego and Dallas and some other cities as well. And I'll talk about that journey. Indirect is where we don't directly contract and call in the customer on our own, but we're using channel partners. Uh, and in the case, you know, so in, in, the, in the case of uh, CPG, you might be using combination of brokers, wholesalers, uh, distribution channels, uh, to get in there, what uh, in there being the kind of final end customer, uh, what we do is, you know, we use people that distribute water hardware and water equipment. And those might be uh, food services companies, it might be plumbing distributors, it might be Granger, it might be Amazon. And we've just more recently started working on and levering indirect channels. And I hopefully, time permitting, we'll get a little bit of a time to talk about why I have segmented indirect to be much later than direct. The headline on it is ultimately, we wanted to be able to prove out the metrics, control our destiny, kind of own the customer, look at unit economics, market economics, and then be able to build the brand in a very directed and controlled way so that we would be setting the stage for what's to come. Uh, on the growth marketing side, that's kind of, you know, if, if I were to draw a, well, we're kind of like trying to do the, this company for that industry, um, which sometimes I'm reticent to always use those parallels because everyone always says, well, I'm the Uber for this and I'm the Tesla for that. And I'm not going to say that today. Uh, but uh, I, I will say, you know, Casper, for example, has done an amazing job of taking a piece of durables and uh, kind of breaking the model by going direct and going direct enables, uh, you know, a lot more nonlinear scale and also a lot more control. And uh, that's effectively what growth marketing is, which is utilizing direct response, digital, paid, organic, to make the phone ring or metaphorically phone ring, leads come in, and to be able to scale in markets that precede sales infrastructure. Talk a little bit more about that later as well, but in our business where we have a B2B sale 
and you're doing direct sales with sales reps, tax trucks, you're doing all the installations, uh, how you scale is very linear. And it's also directly proportional to the capital that you have because you've got higher OPEX on the front loading side and uh, the way the cash flows work, uh, you have to be really mindful about how you scale and how quickly you scale. Growth marketing is fantastic because it enables nonlinear scale. Uh, more on that later. And then the last one is really to build an epic brand people love. And uh, that's really what we started with. Uh, I put that third just so I get the end on that. But part of this is making sure that the product that we have and when someone touches a refill station and they fill up at a flow water device and they have this moment of truth where the unit first gets installed into a hotel, a school, a corporation, a retailer, an essential business, uh, you know, effectively whatever it is that they're having this amazing experience with water and then being able to document those outcomes uh, and also cover that later. So a little bit about our commercialization strategy. When I look at uh, where we started here and kind of phase one was, all right, well, a couple people in a garage, in a coffee shop, getting funding, you know, you got a product concept. I'm skipping a lot of time around development of the product, iterations, mock-ups, renditions, CAD drawings. I don't do CAD, but we worked with somebody third party that helped us, uh, you know, take iterations and ideation and turn it into CADs, finding a manufacturer. I'm skipping about um, nine, nine months of very gnarly and intensive effort around building a hardware company because that's not the point of this talk, but I'm gonna kind of fast forward to where we were in 2014, which is, okay, now we got a product built. We've got four, eight, 12, 16, 20 of them. Now what? Because going into every new business, uh, as we're all starting businesses, we all have these hypotheses. And so, you know, you do your preliminary testing and you do some prototyping and then you start to figure stuff out. Uh, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. And so what we did in this case was focus, just hyper-focused in a single market. And we picked San Francisco because that was our backyard. And so there's a little bit of a hesitancy that I had around picking San Francisco also because, you know, you pick one city and then, you know, it happens to be your backyard and it happens to be San Francisco. And then somebody in, you know, talking to other people in Dallas and they're like, yeah, great, it works in SF, but does it work in Dallas? Or does it work in Columbus, Ohio, my hometown? Uh, or, you know, does it work, you know, in the East Coast? And New York's different than San Francisco. So all that being said, because it was our backyard, because we wanted to have access to customers, because I wanted to be in the market, because we wanted to see break fix issues, because we wanted to be able to really track Salesforce productivity and look at the sales funnel. We started right in our own backyard, even though there was a little bit of a demerit in my mind which we actually never really got discounted for as we were talking to investors and as I went to go uh, raise more capital. Um, but that's partly because of how we staged it and also going to other markets and proving out other proof points. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, starting and proving out the metrics in a single segment. I'm gonna kind of cover two topics here. One is I did mention, you know, you have to have a hypothesis in my opinion going into it, but at the same time, you gotta be willing to be wrong. And so I'll give you an example. One of the things that, that we were certain of was that there's, this was gonna be a massive market in universities and that they were gonna adopt right away. Um, and the model actually within universities, this is really the pillar and the, the core of the whole business ideation at the very beginning was, put flow water on college campuses, largely, not exclusively, largely. Uh, it's, it, we, we set up our very first refill stations to be vended. So had a credit card reader on there. You know, I, I worked with somebody to do uh, 3G telemetry, PCI level one compliant for the gateway. I mean, there was a lot of kind of metrics and uh, tracking that we put into place to have this uh, digital system effectively where you could transact. And it was basically take a bottle like this and fill it up for 75 cents instead of uh, buying a single use plastic water bottle. That didn't work. I don't think that didn't work, not because it wasn't a great market opportunity and a really good um, segment that we can unlock. It didn't work because people weren't acclimated to do that at that point eight years ago. Universities are very difficult to sell into. Uh, you know, we're fighting against Coke and Pepsi bottled water contracts, tons of decision makers, really bureaucratic. There's a little bit of friction between administration and students, what students wanted to drive. 
you know, kind of faculty administration, people that are getting revenues from bottled water, what have you, might not have been either as receptive or just didn't move as quickly. Uh, so that's an example where hypothesis going into it went deployed into several universities, saw the friction, uh, while we were also deploying into other verticals that were perhaps not part of the hypothesis, but um, were exploratory. And we found hot spots. We found, we found hot, positive hot spots in other areas. And so, you know, it's easy to say, hey, let's cut beta in this university thing, just set this on the side. Uh, out of 5,000 refill stations in the United States, throughout the United States, about half of which are not uh, any longer in kind of core markets or core states. Uh, I think we have three that are still operating under this original model, three refill stations out of 5,000. So um, you can see we went where, you know, the wind was at our back as opposed to keeping going when the wind is at your face. That being said, when you're starting a company, sometimes it feels like all the wind is in your face all the time. Um, so you have to be mindful of that. I, a couple learnings that I would make just in terms of this prove your metrics in a single segment this is where, you know, to kind of use an old CPG expression, like the question always is, will the dogs eat the dog food? And, um, you know, that, that expression really lends itself to when you get a product out in the market, you know, will people buy it? Do they adopt it? Do they love it? Do they stay? Will they pay for it? How much will they pay for it? You don't know any of these things. And so uh, I think, in my opinion, one of the, the, the mistakes that, I think people make, uh, and I think also one of the things that that um, are, are critical success factors are getting at the leadership level and at the founder level, people out in the field. I mean, if you are, uh, if, if you are a CEO or a founder or an executive of an early stage company, you need to be able to get out in the field and spend time in the field. And if you can't sell, you got to go with someone that can sell or, or, you know, hopefully you can sell, but some people have other gifts in other areas and they can hack away and code away like nobody's business. And that's, that's great. Uh, I cannot do that. So I've run several tech companies, but I can't go and actually physically code. Um, so a lot of admiration and props for people that do that, but you still have to be able to get out in the field to understand what are the market dynamics, what's happening, and to test and learn and understand what the KPIs are. The last thing that I would say here is just being relentless and focusing on the KPIs in the sales funnel. How many leads do you have to call on? How many phone calls? How many visits? What's the conversion rate? If you're offering free trials, you know what does that look like? And then what does churn look like at the bottom of the funnel after you get somebody in as a paying customer? And log the data. You know, I, I think you know it's really okay on a spreadsheet. I would use something, you know, Salesforce is ultimately, it's what, you know, we use as we scale, but early on we used uh, and, and still have for a while, pipe drive, really inexpensive, very simple. It's a good way to be able to keep tracking your metrics and get going. Uh, the second stage really was on, is this process repeatable? And so, you know, then the kind of question ends up being, hey, great, it worked in SF, but is it gonna work in a, elsewhere across the United States? And so this is where, uh, you know, and you also have to be careful if you're one of the founders uh, or execs selling the product, you also have to make sure that, you know, it's not just you that's able to sell it, that other people that can scale can sell that as well. Uh, and so that's where we hired a couple of sales reps. We expanded into LA and San Diego. We did a little bit outside of California as well, layered in a few sales reps, dedicated sales director, a quick note about sales reps, two things that I look for. Um, a lot of times I think people with a lot of experience, you know, that sometimes people with a lot of experience in selling are not the best at selling early stage. They're better at scaling it, but they're not as kind of feisty. I've found in our experience that getting someone, you know, that had a lot of energy, really coachable, has a great personality and has sold something door to door. You know, maybe they've sold um, Comcast or they've sold, uh, Cutco knives door to door or cookware or some, if, if you can sell in those markets uh, and, and, and you're coming out of college or you're earlier in your career, you can sell pretty much anything. And so that's one. I also found competitive athletes as another really great proxy because having people that are hyper competitive that want to win, that also are coachable and good at working at teams being two success factors for sales reps. So we did that. We expanded it into some regional events. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what we did in events. I might cover it a little bit later. 
And then we started with brand building, consumer engagement with social PR. Uh, part of the reason for driving into PR at the stage that we did is in hardware because of the linearity with how hardware scales. I mean, we have our business up to this point has primarily been 120 pound piece of equipment that you, you know, have to sell in and then you have to ship somewhere and then you actually have to have a tech go show up. They have to hook it up, comes on a pallet. Uh, so you have to schedule it. They have to hook it up. Uh, it takes about an hour, not terribly long, but it's not like, you know, SaaS or AWS where you turn it on the cloud and then suddenly you're national or you're worldwide. Uh, and it's not like CPG where you have distribution channels. So you get into a couple big CPG retailers in food drug mass, and then suddenly you got 3,000 doors or 5,000 doors or 10,000 doors. And it's also not that easy in those sides, but there's no infrastructure when you're building out uh, kind of your own hardware business on your own. So part of what we did was start to build out regional infrastructure and uh, layering in PR as a way to try to get the mind share before we got to the market share. Uh, and then the last thing that we started doing was really pulling in outcomes data. And so I, I think, you know, when people talk to me about, um, you know, sometimes I hear people talk about fab selling is very kind of traditional old school way of selling feature advantage benefit. Uh, fab selling is dead, in my opinion. I, you know, I don't think it's a good way to sell. It's you know, what we're doing with Flowwater is decommoditizing a super commoditized market. And what I mean by that is there are 1.6 million black box water coolers in the United States. You all know them, you've seen them at the office. It's a cooler, it's black box. You don't know the name of it. You've never seen it. You've never heard of the company before. No one's walking around seeing, I'm, drink, I'm drinking this kind of type of water that's coming out of a black box. And kind of likewise, same thing with 10 million water fountains in the US, 5.5 million five gallon jugs. And all of that industry is all around kind of feature advantage benefit. Um, what I love and I think has been probably the most powerful catalyst for our company is to look at outcomes. So what we started doing is we started doing surveys pre-post using the Flow Water product. And what we found, uh, which was the hypothesis going in, but the data that we found coming out of that was uh, insane, which was consumers drink two to five times more water once they have a flow water refill station, then whatever they had before, which could be a water fountain, a five gallon jug, bottled water, uh, a point of use water cooler. And then we also found super interestingly, a 50% reduction in soda and coffee consumption. And then in cases where single use plastics were being made available, freely available, we saw an 80% decline in single use plastics. Well, getting that data for us, and then we've continued to accelerate that. So we do taste testing, water testing, we put all this into metrics and we do third party analysis on this when it's appropriate. And, you know, we have this one slide here is an example of, you know, 40 slides and 40 different uh, pieces of data from many different companies over the years that show when we deploy a flow water refill station, the outcomes are insane as it relates to consumers or students or employees or guests. They're hydrating more, they're drinking less coffee and soda, and all of that's a good thing. That completely changes the game. So I, I think, you know, kind of the headline on this is look for ways to differentiate really around outcomes data versus feature advantage benefit selling, because that's where you're laying the foundation for being able to scale nationally. So kind of bringing this closer to a close here, because I want to be really mindful of time and I hopefully leaving time for a few questions at the end. But uh, 2016 to 2018, the current is really all about scaling, scaling and scaling. So how do we do that? We started partnering with events to get national brand rec recognition, Dreamforce, Coachella, CrossFit Games. Uh, we've done all of those events for many years since uh, 2016. And we're getting an amazing kind of experience and moment of truth with the customer or the consumer where they're having a great time in a location that they know by brand and there's affinity and adjacency there. Uh, we also spent more time and more money in PR activity. And then we started working on national accounts. And that's one of the ways to be able to grow non-linearly. So we would go and work with national hotel brands, national fitness brands, national corporations that have footprints across the US. Uh, I started that process again, kind of like I started on just getting into the market and local sales when there were two of us to see, you know, can we sell it? How much, 
Is there a there there? What are the unit economics? What are the market economics? And then layering sales reps onto that. Did the same thing on the national accounts. Uh, about 40%, uh, 50% of our business now is kind of outside of local business accounts or city to city specific. There are more kind of top down or growth marketing, which I'll get to in a minute. So at this point, we've built out a, a full national te account team. Uh, one person covers the East Coast, another person covers the West Coast, and there's other people that supplement that. And then how do we kind of really, really scale beyond that, which is kind of 2019 to current, I'll end on this, which is using growth marketing and using sales reps, but also non-linear ways to grow and ultimately being able to lock, unlock, how do you open up Columbus, Ohio and Louisville, Kentucky and Charleston and Austin and Dallas and New York when you don't have infrastructure there. Well, the way that you do that is through paid and unpaid uh, digital media. Uh, so what we started with was, you know, effectively just establishing the KPIs. So, you know, what do we think the cost per lead needs to be and what's the conversion rate? And what's LTV to CAC need to be? And also monitoring things like website traffic and certainly margin analysis, because when you are scaling in different channels, the margins could and probably very well be different than um, you know when you're going direct using a sales force. Hopefully it's more efficient. I mean, what we see on the growth marketing side is a 20 to 30% efficiency on reducing OPEX and the ability to grow in areas that precede the need to hire some sales infrastructure to get there. Uh, so we turned on growth marketing that included paid advertising, search and social, social media development, more PR, um, and, you know, when I look at growth marketing, I'm pretty, you know, here's a bunch of, this, this is not intended for you to really do much with other than just see this is very macro how we track stuff. Um, but it all comes down to LTV to CAC. And my perspective on this on events, PR, email, organic SEO, I'm super agnostic. Now, apart from events, events are strategically designed to build the brand. So there's some other benefit to that. Uh, but that being said, you know, this is all about a mathematical exercise for me. Do I care whether it's coming in organic versus paid search? I really don't. I really care about the math and what LTV to CAC looks like. And when we started this process, our LTV to CAC ratio and what you'll see, a couple examples of ad, ad units, you know, how you think about LTV to CAC and LTV stands for, everyone probably knows this, but lifetime value of the customer. CAC stands for the customer acquisition cost embedded in that. You should include ad spend, agency fees, sales cost to close. And how to think about the number, anything lower than three, not so good. Uh, you really need to optimize that. It's not, you know, one or two is not good. Uh, two to three is where you're like, all right, I maybe have something here, but we need to start tweaking. Uh, and this is probably where you're gonna start out. Anything over three is a really good ROI. Approaching five or higher is just really kicking ass. So if you can get to a five, you know, four and a half, five, five and a half, six, uh, that's where you start to plow more money into growth marketing initiatives. Uh, kind of headline on this ends up being test the daylights out of it. You know, you got to make no assumption. I mean, don't hold true to too many assumptions into it. Test and let the math direct you as to, you know, what's a click ratio, what's a landing page look like, test lots of landing pages, test lots of ad units, test lots of copy. Uh, most of that is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's a fair amount that we've done as it relates to emails, blogs, and content strategy, as well as uh, driving PR. We've generated around 320 million impressions since launch. Part of this is a lead gen strategy. Part of this is also just a strategy around making sure that uh, a mission and a movement gets embedded into the marketplace as we are growing and scaling. Uh, lastly, I've done a poor job of leaving enough time for Q&A, but I think I'm going to at least end on time. Uh, a few other learnings. Uh, cast a wide net. Don't be, uh, you have to have initial assumptions. You also may be flat out wrong and be willing to say you're wrong. It is really freeing when uh, you can say, hey, we thought this, totally wrong. No embarrassment to it. We're all going to be wrong along the way. The faster you can admit that you're wrong on something, the easier things are to adjust and move forward. Uh, so, also using metrics, you know, that's a must do. Uh, number two, as you go, find the recipe, double down as you scale. So, I'm big into templatizing roadmaps, recipes, game plans, figuring out what the data shows, and then being able to build that and bake that into a plan. And then you 
write that plan out and you turn it into training materials, you turn it into resources, you turn it into train the trainer, you turn it into SOP documentation, you turn it into sales commissions and how they get commissioned for which verticals that you want them to go after and really double down on that as you scale. So not everybody is kind of trying to create their own recipe. Uh, and then the last two, break it every year, which is rebuild your annual plan. Uh, look at kind of rethinking it, which goes against point number two to a degree, but that's our job as leaders and CEOs. And then the last one is as you scale, hire slow, fire fast, develop a rigorous hiring methodology. The best platform I have identified that we have pretty much fully adopted is uh, Who by Jeffrey Smart. That's the book. You should buy it. I think it's fantastic. Even if you only agree with 80% of it, uh, I think 80% solution fully executed will you get you some great results. And that's been really helpful for us. Uh -huh.